to thank UC Irvine Health for its partnership with us in providing this program for you. Let me, there, is that better? <laughs> Stop wiggling around. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Mike and Polly Smith, who've been with us since the beginning of this program. It's been actually a decade now. And we were able to honor them this summer at our summer solstice. And it was quite a reunion because all of the people on the staffs at UCI and here at the library and in a program were present uh, to celebrate with them. And this is uh, quite an undertaking. I don't think we acknowledged uh, Jane Merritt enough. Jane, are you back there? Can you stand up? And Kunga, our program director, they worked very hard to coordinate this program for us. Thank you. Thank you. So a quick bit about us. The Library Foundation is a membership-driven organization. How many of you are members? Good. If you're not, we'd love for you to join. We do all kinds of things. Uh, we provide valuable resources. We have downloadable books, magazines, streaming films that have been donated by the foundation, the Media Lab, uh, with his sound studio. Uh, we have donated computers, computer desks, all kinds of things. And so what we do is supplement the things that the city provides for the library with things that the library wouldn't have otherwise. And in addition to that, we have wonderful programs. We have our Library Live, our witty lecture series, Medicine in Our Backyard, uh, the finance program, the book discussion group. So we feel that the foundation is making a tremendous contribution to the community, and we love for all of you to be a part of it. Now, we will be concluding the program with Q&A. If you haven't silenced your phones, I'd appreciate it if you would do it right now. And uh, if you would save your questions until the Q&A after the presentations. So now I'm going to introduce to you tonight's speakers. And we have really amazing speakers. Our first one will be Dr. Shalina Shaw. She is a board certified and fellowship trained UCI health physician who specializes in the management and treatment of adult and pediatric, pe 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 pediatric, pediatric pain. I said, I didn't know that that was a field. <laughs> and we don't think about children being in pain as much as those of us who are older. I just took care of some of my pain with a hip replacement, <laughs> my left hip. So Dr. Shaw earned her medical degree at St. George's University School of Medicine in Granada. She completed a residency in anesthesiology at Weill Cornell Medicine, New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City, followed by a fellowship in adult and pediatric pain management at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital and Children's Hospital of Boston. There she trained under Dr. Charles Byrd, a world authority in the management of pain in children. Our second speaker will be Dr. Richard Harris. He is the new Samuel A. Endowed Chair and Professor in the Department of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Care. He joins us from the University of Michigan. I'm very pleased about that because I, too, <laughs> went to the University of Michigan. He obtained his Bachelor of Science in Genetics from Purdue University and his PhD in Molecular and Cellular Biology from UC Berkeley. Richard is also a graduate of Maryland Institute of Traditional Chinese Medicine and has received an MS in Clinical Research Design and Statistical Analysis at the University of Michigan. So we have two wonderful people to address our pain this evening, and we will begin with Dr. Shaw. So please join me in welcoming her. Thank 
Thank you. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you to the Beach, uh, Newport Beach Fo uh, Library Foundation. This is really an honor. This is actually my second time being here, and the first time I was so impressed with the, the caliber of the questions and the preparation that came into, so, um, into the talk. So please ask those questions. I hope this presentation is engaging, and it kind of sparks some, some thought into your own health. Um, all right, so a little bit about us at UC Irvine. What type of pain do we treat? We treat everything you see here. And if this is not as complex as you can imagine, I'm gonna break it down and primarily just focus tonight on low back pain, okay? So about one in three Americans in the United States, as you can imagine, are living in pain. About 19 million US Americans are actually living with what we call high impact pain. That means it's disabling enough to stop you from working or going to school or, you know, doing your daily activities. And typically, the funnel of which those patients with high impact pain get in front of a pain doctor is very small. So, so much that when we talk about low back pain, we're gonna talk about that one in three Americans actually suffer from low back pain. And typically, I'm going to demystify the process of low back pain and just help you understand the concepts. So there's three real big buckets when we talk about low back pain. One could be a degenerative process which means as we age, the body degenerates. Part of it could be a segmental dysfunction, and we'll talk about that. As we may have sprained ourselves, there might be some kind of segmental movements. Um, and then finally, we have metastatic disease, so cancer-related low back pain, okay? So this is an example of how we treat pain in America. And I bring this up, it's a very busy slide, but I bring it up because the HHS, which is the Health and Human Secretary, has now revamped the way we look and treat low back pain in this country because so many of Americans do suffer from it. And so what they recommend is medications, restorative therapy, such as physical therapy, interventional options, which we will talk about, behavioral health options, and then complementary and integrative therapies, which what Professor Harris will talk about. So that is the new paradigm of how the US government recommends that we treat low back pain. So what is low back pain, and what type of low back pain is there? The first most common type of low back pain is what we call discogenic pain. This is pain that arises from the discs. The discs are just gelatinous material between the bones to support us. In fact, as we evolutionarily developed from apes to homo sapiens, the principal thing that changed our evolutionary trajectory was the disc. And that's what allows us to go from a stooped position to a fully erect position as homo sapiens. It was the evolutionary um, evolution of the disc. The disc is primarily made up of water. So as we age, we lose water and call, as you can, we also lose collagen. So those two things are what causes the disc to degenerate and cause low back pain. And this is the type of pain that's primarily in the back. Now, sometimes the disc can also herniate. You've seen that. You're probably moving a refrigerator, gardening, lifting something that you should not have been lifting that's way too heavy. And what happens to that disc? It now comes out of its normal position and herniates. And so what we call that herniation is when it pushes on a nerve, and that's why you get the sciatica symptoms down your leg. The other most common type of low back pain is what we call facet joint uh, pain. And this is pain, you can see the referral patterns. This is pain typically in the low back, like a band-like pain, occasionally going into the buttocks, but primarily in the low back. And this is also another degenerative process. This is due to the facet joint. The facet joint is the only place where bones talk to each other in the spine. And we use that joint when we extend back, when we rotate our spine. That's the only time we use that facet joint. And just like our knee and our hip and our shoulders that degenerate as we get older, so do these joints. And so as a result, these patients will typically complain of arthritic type of pain, pain that's worse in the morning, stiffness. Um, when, um, and that's typically the presentation. The last most common cause of low back pain is called sacroiliac joint pain. This is pain where the spine meets the pelvis. And it's those two dimples in the low back, that's your sacroiliac joint. Now, it's not a degenerative process. In, in other words, as we age, it doesn't cause more pain. This is the type of pain where you move around too much, you 
torqued your body in the wrong way, that's when this pain um, presents. So it's not a degenerative process. It's not something that occurs as we get older. So how do I prevent low back pain? And I think a lot of the things I'm going to tell you are pretty much things that you've already <laughs> know. But we highly recommend that you exercise daily. Uh, practice good posture. Mechanics are 90% of why we develop low back pain. Lifting correctly, and what that means is historically when people lift, sometimes they lift and they twist at the same time. That's a recipe for a herniation of a disc. So when we lift, we lift, and then we turn the entire body. That's how we should be practicing. Sleeping properly, obviously, and maintaining a healthy weight. Much of the l principal causes of why discs herniate, why discs degenerate, why we get sacroiliitis is because of increased abdominal girth. Obesity is a principal cause of why we get low back pain. So maintaining a, a lower BMI is critical. What are the options? Typically, most of low back pain will resolve with two things. Anti-inflammatories, which are like your Advil class of medications, in conjunction with physical therapy. And the point of physical therapy is to control your core. So this is an example of a patient working with a physical therapist working on the core. Because when we strengthen the core, we offload the spine. You can also use something called a TENS unit, which is a vibration type of beeper that you wear and sends vibratory signals to the back so that pain signals don't get to the brain or the spinal cord. Medications are next. We have a whole host of medications um, from antidepressants to anticonvulsants, muscle relaxants, opioids, which we'll talk about, steroids, anti-inflammatory, which are known as NSAIDs, and topical analgesics, which are like the lidoderm or lidocaine patches, okay, numbing patches. But I would be remiss if I, we talk about opiates and we didn't talk about the opiate epidemic and the pendulum where we found ourselves. Historically, in fact, in California, uh, physicians can lose their license for the under-treatment of pain. And what we realized in, through that mechanism is that we were giving patients a lot of opiate medications. And now the pendulum has sp spun the other way where we're restricting opiates and trying alternative therapies first before using opiate analgesics. For me, I'm of the belief that if it's working for you and it keeps you functional, then there is absolutely a place for opiate analgesics. We just have to be a little bit safer and more thoughtful about how we prescribe. But the side effects of medications obviously are the limiting um, point, um, limiting factor in how aggressively we can treat your pain. And so the next step is interventions. That means injection therapy, cortisone injections, things like that that you've probably heard of. Uh, a recent study showed about a nerve injury rate is 0.03%, so these interventions are incredibly safe. The risks are higher, obviously, in patients who cigarette smoke, have diabetes, or high blood pressure. Uh, but again, still extremely safe and extremely effective. So some types of uh, interventions that you may see um, in your pain clinics, if you go to your pain doctor or your pre primary care doctor may recommend, something called an epidural steroid injection. Now we talked about discogenic pain or herniated disc pain. That's when you would get an epidural steroid injection. We also talked about that facet joint, that arthritic pain. That's when you would get something called a radiofrequency ablation. We'll talk about that. I'll show you a diagram of how that really works. Then we talked about that sacroiliac joint, those two dimples in the body. That's when you would get a sacroiliac joint injection. When those fail, over time steroids will fail, we have other therapies. In fact, one of the reasons I love practicing pain is because of all the fields of medicine, I feel it's the most innovative. We're constantly coming out with new procedures, new techniques, uh, new innovation to treat low back pain. It's a really promising field to be in. So here's an example of a cortisone injection that we talked about, the lumbar epidural steroid injection. It's been around for over 40 years, incredibly safe. We do this below the level of the spinal cord. So serious nerve injuries, it's essentially very, very rare. Um, so the nerve injury risk is about 1 in 500, very rare. Um, and so the steroid decreases the inflammation that's occurring as a result of the herniated disc or the degenerative disc. The next is that facet pain. This is the arthritic pain, that morning stiffness, the pain that's in the band-like pain across your low back. Unlike the shoulder or the knee or the hip, 
we can't replace the joint in the spine, right? We can re replace the joint in our shoulders or in your hip or in our knees, but we can't replace the joints in our spine just yet. So the next best therapy we have is something called radiofrequency ablation, which means we use heat therapy to destroy the nerve that supplies that joint. That nerve has no other function in the body except for that joint, so we can destroy it. Unfortunately, because nerves do regenerate, the nerve will regenerate and the pain will come back. But usually it comes back after 12 months or so. So most patients get six months or 12 months of pain relief without using medications, without steroids. It's, it's incredibly effective. And this is an example of the radiofrequency ablation and how we do it. We always do it under live x-ray um, and we're targeting that joint pain. Head and neck pain, obviously, is not the to topic of today, but I want to let you know there's a lot of good therapies out there for head pain, neck pain, arthritis in the neck, just like it can develop in the low back, it can also develop in the neck. Um, and we've got six, just a tremendous amount of new innovation coming out in that space. So what's new? What's new is, first of all, does injection therapy work? The answer is yes. This is a study that was done um, in 2013, looking at millions of cases of Medicare um, beneficiaries who underwent these procedures. We're talking very, very big data sets and found that the evidence is very strong for the things that we're, we do typically for low back pain, for epidural steroid injections, radiofrequency ablations, things like that. Um, what is stimulation therapy? So this is something that's new. It's using electricity to block the pain signal so that pain doesn't even get to the spinal cord or to the brain for processing. There's two types of stimulation therapies out there. One is spinal cord stimulation, where you put a very thin electric um, um, wire near the spinal cord to diminish the pain. Um, and then there's peripheral nerve stimulation, which is the newest advance, quite honestly, in pain management. It's a non-permanent system, it's the diameter of a hair, quite frankly, that we implant through a needle that sits along a nerve and patients wear it only for 60 days. After 60 days, we remove the therapy and most patients, about 75% of patients, will still have pain, about 50% relief of their pain at the 12 month mark. So incredible amount of innovation coming out in the pain space. Under indications, who do we not do any of these therapies on? We don't do it on patients who have significant psychological issues in which, you know, having a medical device would preclude them um, from this therapy. Uh, patients with uncontrolled bleeding disorders, infections, uh, pacer, because sometimes these stimulation electrical therapies can affect a pacemaker or AICD. Cancer is a relative contraindication. That means if you have cancer or you're recovering from cancer, we can still deliver these therapies. We just have to time it around the chemotherapy. Um, and the entire point of low back pain is yes, is to treat your pain, but quite honestly, this is the cycle that develops. If any of you suffer from pain, then you know what I'm talking about. It's a patient who has pain and then they can't move because it hurts to move. And when you can't move, then you, don't, you can't do the activities that you normally would be doing. And because of that, you've de developed some anxiety. And if, after that, you developed some depression because you're stuck at home. You can't even get to the refrigerator to do your normal cooking and cleaning and your household chores and relying on you know, your children or, or caregivers to help you. And from that depression, pain gets worse. Because anxiety and depression travel at the same place as pain in our human body. And that is no surprise why you see patients who have chronic pain also have a significant amount of anxiety and depression. And then having anxiety and depression just makes that pain worse. So this is the point of why we treat pain so aggressively and why it's so important to make sure that we don't develop pain by doing all those um, you know, preventative options. But if you do develop pain, um, you know, I hope you take away today that there is a lot of hope. This field is expanding constantly with a lot of new innovation. So I will stop here and turn it over to Professor Harris. He'll talk to you about integrative options for pain, and then we'll open it up to question and answers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. That was a very exciting talk, very informative, uh, very good to learn about all the different ways that we have to, to treat pain. So what I'm going to talk to you about today are three integrative forms of treatment that can be used to help with pain. 
we're going to talk a lot about acupuncture, and then we're going to talk some about meditation and then Tai Chi. And I'll, I'll warn you up front, I'm a researcher, so I'm going to show some research slides. So feel free to just gloss over if you don't want to, but I feel like it's necessary to show data in order to justify uh, certain treatments. So I think it's important. So pain is the number one reason people seek medical care. It's the number one symptom for seeking medical care. And it's no surprise that it's also the number one symptom that integrative therapists uh, you treat as well. So uh, the mind-body interventions are used extensively and acupuncture, meditation, Qigong, which is a form of meditation, and yoga and Tai Chi are all mind-body interventions that are used to help uh, treat pain. Has anyone had acupuncture before? Just out of curiosity. Oh, a lot of people have. Okay, so you all have seen acupuncture needles. A lot of you have. So you can see um, this lady has an acupuncture needle in her neck here. So they're very thin. Their gauge is about 35 or 34 to 36 gauge, so very, very thin. Um, you can see the thick part is the handle where the acupuncturist holds the needle, and then they're inserted in various parts of the body. Um, does anyone know what this, this is here on the bottom? Has anyone seen what that in the lower right there? It's called moxibustion, or moxa. It's an herb which is placed on the needle, and it's often uh, lit like incense, and then the heat then penetrates into the body where, where it can do its, its healing action. So acupuncture is actually just one component of traditional East Asian medicine, much like drugs, surgeries, uh, physical therapy are just individual components of Western medicine. So the needling is just one component. So if you go to an acupuncturist, you may get herbs, uh, you may get a tea that you might drink, you may get exercise, Tai Chi, um, which we'll talk about in a bit. You may get Tui Na, which is a form of massage or acupressure. And then there's also cupping, if you've ever seen those cupping marks that people get um, with the cupping. So that's very good at releasing muscle tension. So that's something that, might, that you might get in addition to the needling. So then the needles are inserted in specific spots on the body. And you can see this acupuncture uh, doll here. So the needles aren't placed just randomly. There's, there's a specific theory behind where to place the needles. And that theory is based on this concept of qi, which doesn't really translate so well into Western language. But we can think of qi as like the body's own energy, so energy in the body. And much like the way nervous tissue conducts energy along your nerves, we think that there's these meridians, which um, are where qi flows in the body. And you insert needles into the body and you regulate the flow of that qi, much like you regulate the flow of water in your house by turning on and off faucets, for example. So what the goal is to balance the qi. You don't want too much, you don't want too little, you want an even uh, and even balancing, and so the acupuncture needling uh, goes at balancing that. So what's the research? Um, many of you, if you've never had acupuncture before, um, you're probably wondering, like, what's, what's the data out there that suggests that it's useful? So I'm gonna present two research studies done by the Acupuncture Trialist Collaborative, which looked to see, what, question one, is acupuncture better than no treatment or just wait list? And the second question, is acupuncture better than sham treatment or placebo? So this is uh, the summary slide for low back pain as well as neck pain. And what you can see on the line, there's a vertical line here in the middle that's situated at zero. And then each study is a dot. So this is a dot here that had 171 individuals. And the centroid of the dot is the mean effect. If that falls to the right of this vertical line, it favors acupuncture. If it falls to the left, it favors the control, which is no treatment. And well, what you can see is almost all of these studies are falling to the right, meaning that they're all favoring acupuncture uh, over just waitlisting or waiting for it to solve on, solve on its own. And so looking at other conditions like migraine, osteoarthritis, and low back pain, the effect sizes are actually quite large. So they're, they're 0 0.5, 7, 0.55, 0.42, they're all highly significant. These studies, the studies used 14,597 patients, so it was a very well-powered study. What about the sham controls? So 
There's different ways to do placebo controls for acupuncture. You try to have, to, you actually try to fool the patient into thinking that they got an acupuncture treatment when in fact they didn't. One of those ways is to just pr prick the skin with a sharp device to make it feel like they've gotten a needle. There's actually these fancy retractable needles down here on the lower right where it's kind of like a stage dagger. When you, when you stab one with a stage dagger, the blade retracts into the handle. Well, they have needles like that where they stick the needle in and it looks like it's going into your skin, but it's actually just getting retracted up into the handle. So there's all these ways of doing sham or placebo-controlled acupuncture studies. This is the same condition, low back pain and neck pain, and these are the same kind of slides, and we're showing all the different studies, and again, you can see all the studies are following on the right, which just means that they're favoring acupuncture over sham, but you might notice that they're actually a bit closer to this vertical line, and some of them have air bars which cross the vertical line, which means that study failed. It didn't show a difference between acupuncture and sham acupuncture, but if you average across all the studies and you pull the data together, you find a nice significant finding. Now, the effect sizes are much smaller, 0 0.15, 0 0.16, 0 0.23. There's no difference in the acupuncture that was being pro provided. The acupuncture is the same. The only thing we changed was the control. We changed it to a sham control. So what about some other uh, effect sizes? So we've learned a little bit about drugs. The effect size for NSAIDs, is 0.15 to 0.2. So for example, going back, the effect size for acupuncture versus sham acupuncture is 0.15 to 0.23. So that effect size is as significant as an NSAID for knee osteoarthritis. Pregabalin for fibromyalgia is not a whole lot better, 0.23, 0.25 to 0.3. Um, and then there's obviously, often there's side effects to um, certain medications that we take. So for example, you might get nausea or dizziness or uh, heaven forbid gastric bleeding. So there's a large problem with gastric bleeding with, with taking some, some medications and acupuncture is a nice uh, alternative that we have at our disposal. This is a study which basically showed that acupuncture effects persist. If you get five acupuncture treatments over the course of one to two months, the pain stays away for over a year. So that means that you don't have to go back and keep getting treatments monthly. You can wait after you've, get, you've, you've received your amount. Sometimes the pain just stays away completely as well. So let's talk about um, other treatments. What about meditation? So um, there are many types of meditation around. There's many types of schools of meditation. But in general, they all uh, focus on maintaining the mind, being aware and mindful of what the mind is doing. And many times when we develop mindfulness, we develop compassion or wisdom for ourselves. And that's one of the things that comes along with, with meditation. Typically, you're, there's a non-judgmental stance in, in the sense that you're not judging everything. You're not judging your thoughts. You're just letting the thoughts come and then they pass. Um, so that's often a, 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 an aspect of that as well. And um, we often become friends with our mind. Uh, Sometimes we're not so friendly with our minds, and our minds play tricks on us to some degree. And so with meditation, you learn to become friends with your mind, and you're okay with the neuroses that we have. We just kind of get used to it, and it's okay. So what about meditation research? So meditation for pain. So this is a similar kind of diagram. I've just highlighted the pain one here on the bottom. So pain is significantly improved with meditation. Meditation also helps with things like anxiety, depression, stress, negative affect, and improves sleep as well as substance abuse. So meditation is a very good treatment that you can use. You can teach yourself with self-help books or you can get training. Um, you can do it at home. You can do it basically anywhere. So it's, it's a very effective way to manage. Um, and now we're going to end with Tai Chi. Has anyone, does anyone do Tai Chi? A couple, oh, excellent. So Tai Chi is a form of exercise that's been around for over 3,000 years in China, so it's very, very common. And um, it's based on the philosophy of Taoism, which is like being one with nature, being one with uh, the ebb and flow of the seasons and whatnot. And so it teaches the natural balance of things. And what happens is when you live in alignment with nature and with the, the seasons and everything, 
uh, you end up having a much easier time and things don't bother you quite as much and you become more calm. There's three types of uh, Tai Chi forms that are around. There's Wu, Qin, and then Yang style Tai Chi. Tai Chi is a little bit different than regular exercise. So how do I mean that? Well, um, both regular exercise that you might be used to and Tai Chi, they, they both have cardiovascular benefits. They improve respiration. They can improve weight bearing, strength, and flexibility. But one thing that Tai Chi does in addition is that it trains the mind. Um, much as what we were talking about with meditation where we train the mind to think in a certain way, Tai Chi allows you to integrate the body and the mind together in the same exercise. And uh, that balancing between the mind and the body is uh, health promoting. Many times it's, it's good to be one. It's good to be in this body, aware of this body, and aware of the mind at the same time. So Tai Chi can be called, thought of as kind of like a meditative practice in some ways. So this is, a, this is one of the first studies that was done uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, on Tai Chi. This was for a condition called fibromyalgia, which we haven't talked about very much, but fibromyalgia is a chronic widespread pain condition that afflicts about 4 to 8% of the population, so it's quite, quite common. And so in this study, which is the first one that came out in the New England Journal, um, they compared Tai Chi versus control exercises. And you can see on, on the scale here, all of the downward trajectories for all of these symptoms, so the fibromyalgia in, impact questionnaire, sleep improved, um, global assessment of pain improved, um, so did physical activity, uh, as well as depression, and improved, improvements in, this, in the six minute walk. So, Tai Chi was affecting not just the pain, it was helping their sleep, it was helping their mood, um, in addition to the pain. And that's one of the things that we call, often find with these integrated therapies is many times they don't just address the pain that you have, they also address other symptoms that go along with the pain and they do it in a very gentle, uh, easy way. So in summary, um, I hope that you walk away with this, that acupuncture, meditation, and Tai Chi are effective at reducing pain. Um, their, their actions are not placebo effects. They're not just placebos. I didn't really talk very much about the brain, but we do know that Tai Chi, meditation, and acupuncture can all affect the brain and help the brain function better. So there's mechanistic data out there. Um, they're, very, they're very safe and they're starting to become uh, in integrated into clinical guidelines. And we, we definitely need as many interventions as we can at our tool, at our, at our disposal for um, the cases where we don't want to use things like necessarily like opioids if, if those are contraindicated. So um, that was it. And this is the Susan Samuel Integrative Health Institute at UC Irvine, where we're doing uh, research in integrative therapies, as well as doing a lot of clinical care uh, for patients. And so um, that's it. Thank you very much. I guess that, I guess that was the last question. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. Let's thank Dr. McCarris and Dr. Uh, our next meeting will be on October 23rd. Dr. Lisa Gibbs is coming to talk to us about healthful aging. And uh, I hope you go forward and, and have a pain-free month. <laughs> Get control of your minds. <laughs> Thank you.